This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles. Unlimited access starts at just $2.99 a month, and for 30 days, it's for free. If you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash geographics and use the code geographics. More on them in a bit. Easter Island's Chile. A tiny speck of land covering 63 square miles, that's 163 square kilometers, inhabited by less than 8,000 people, almost invisible amidst the vast sprawl of the Pacific Ocean. Possibly the most remote island on the planet, it's a full 2,300 miles west of South America and 1,100 miles from the nearest island. Yes, this apparently insignificant grain of sand is home to one of the most fascinating cultures in the world, one that never ceases to raise questions of its people its art and its customs. Welcome to today's Geographics, because it's time to offer some answers about Easter Island. So, how does one actually get there? Well, your best bet is to book a flight from Santiago, the capital of Chile. In 5 hours and 15 minutes, you'll cover a distance of 2,336 miles before landing in Mataveri, the island's international airport, considered to be one of the most remote terminals in the world. Easter Island is today a major tourist destination, but this only became possible after the mid-1970s when regular flights were established to and from mainland Chile. Before that, Mataveri's single airstrip was permanently booked by NASA as an abort site for space shuttles. In other words, if something went wrong after takeoff, crews could stage an emergency landing there, not that it was ever actually used for that purpose. Leaving the main town, Hangaroa, to the south, visitors can reach the Anakai Tangata Cave, famous for its fading paintings of ships and sacred birds. Anakai Tangata loosely translates into Cave Eat Man. Such a name could be interpreted in a reassuring way. Cave where men eat, or it could be interpreted more worryingly as the cave that literally eats men. Or even worse, it could be the cave where men are eaten. So did cannibalism take place on Easter Island? Well, according to some researchers, yes, as a consequence of warfare and famines. But I'll get to those theories a little bit later. From Anakai Tangata, you can climb to the Arano Cow Crater, overlooking a thousand-foot cliffs. If you haven't fainted from exhaustion, well, you can enjoy the magnificent viewpoints before continuing your walk to Arongo, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Orongo was the major site of worship for the Birdman cults, one of the major religions of the Rapa Nui, the natives of Easter Island. Each year, the Rapa Nui would compete to win the title of Tangata Manu, or Birdman. Each contestant would sponsor a representative to participate in a highly dangerous race. Imagine an Ironman triathlon, minus the bicycle, and plus a constant risk of death. These representatives had to first scale the dangerous face of the Ranukau Cliff, then swim shark-infested waters to the small island of Motu Nui. There, they had to find an egg of a sooty tern, a rare and elusive breed of bird. The first to find an egg for their sponsor was declared the winner and crowned Tangata Manu for the span of one year. That gave the victor and their clan all the benefits of a god, which included living in a luxury hut for 12 months, doing nothing but eating and sleeping. A year of leisure sounds pretty good, considering that the winner had just risked his life several times over. Competitors could have fallen down a cliff, been mauled by a shark, or just drowned. The next stop on our tour of this island is the so-called Navel of the World, a phrase sometimes used to describe the island itself. The navel is a large round boulder in the center of a rock perimeter, so, well, what's the big deal? Well, this mysterious rock is believed to have traveled to the island with its first king, Hotu Matua, and according to legend, all life in the world sprang from it. Legends aside, the rock does display the strange power to send compasses into confusion, most likely due to the presence of polarized metals within it. Another celebrated stone on the island is Pu O Hiro, or Trumpet of Hiro, a rain deity. The Rapa Nui would blow into the natural hole at the top of the stone, and this created a loud trumpeting sound. The sound was used to summon a gathering, for example, and it was even believed to attract fish to swim up to the shoreline. As I mentioned earlier, and will do again over this episode, Easter Island has an intense history of warfare, and Puo Hero was a valued trophy paraded around the island by whichever victorious faction could get a hold of it. Okay, so that quick tour should be enough for an archaeology fix. As you travel back to Matter 
Canterbury Airport, though, you might have this nagging feeling that there was something else worth seeing on this island. So what could that be? Well, I'm going to tell you all about that in just a moment after I've talked about today's fantastic sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. If you're enjoying this video, why not, once you're done here, pop over to Curiosity Stream and try out for free a series called A Curious Worlds. It's a series of short videos, and one of them focuses on ancient builders, so it's worth a watch if you're enjoying this video. But that is just one example of a wealth of great content that Curiosity Stream have on their platform. It's available on loads of different platforms. There's a web app, a Roku, Smart TV, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, PS4, whatever, Amazon Kindle. It's also available worldwide. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, and for you guys, the first 30 days are completely free if you just go to curiositystream.com forward slash geographics, use the promo code geographics, there's also a link below, and use that free trial to check out the series that I'm recommended. It's also a great way to support this show, and it keeps us doing what we are doing. So yes, please go do that, and let's get back to today's video. So before the break, I mentioned there might be something we're forgetting. And yes, that would be the massive giant heads made of stone. So yes, let's talk about these things that have made the island famous all over the world. There are almost a thousand of these fascinating statues standing like faithful sentinels against the cruel indifference of nature and time. The Moai are monoliths. In other words, they are carved from a single piece of volcanic stone originating from the solidified ashes that were spewed out of the crater of the Rano Raraku. Most of these statues weigh around 20 tons, and they stand at 20 feet or 6 meters tall. But these are just averages, of course. One of them, nicknamed El Gigante, the giant, may weigh up to 182 metric tons. That's the same as two Boeing 737s, including passengers. This giant would have stood at 72 feet, that's almost 20 meters, if it had stood at all. El Gigante was left unfinished and was discovered laying by a quarry at Rano Raraku. And this is the right time to raise the right questions. Who built the Moai? How did they achieve such a feat? Why did they do it? And also we got to ask, how did they move these gigantic monoliths from the quarry to their final locations? As we've mentioned, Easter Island is located some 2,000 miles west of South America, so who could have possibly reached such an isolated place? The most widely accepted theory is that the original inhabitants of the islands were Polynesian seafarers, most likely from what are today known as the Marquesas Islands. While early European colonists in the 18th century believed Polynesians to be a primitive society, these populations were highly skilled and sophisticated sailors, adept at building sturdy boats and at navigating the perilous waters of the Pacific. Legends have preserved the name of Hotu Matua, the first king of the Rapa Nui, who landed on the island with a big canoe, his wife, and a few companions. But beyond these oral traditions, the only written records of the island are the wooden Rongo Rongo tablets, which have never been translated. So scholars still disagree on exactly why the first Polynesians arrived on Easter Island and when, with estimates varying between the 4th and 13th century CE. Now, while most scholars agreed that the Rapa Nui descended from the settlers of Polynesian origin, some others suggest that a second migration may have originated from Inca-dominated regions in South America. One of them is celebrated Norwegian anthropologist Thor Heyerdahl. The first piece of evidence is the fact that the Rapa Nui used to farm and eat yams or sweet potatoes, which are common in South America, but are believed to be endemic to neither Easter Islands nor Polynesia. You can also add to that the Rongo Rongo tablets. While this script has never been deciphered, Heyerdahl found evidence of a similarly styled script around Lake Titicaca in the Andes Range. Heyerdahl also led the famous expedition of the Contiki, a balsa woodcraft with which he crossed the Pacific in 1947 from South America to Polynesia. Other researchers have disputed these claims. DNA analysis of skeletal remains on the island shows a strong link to that of modern-day Polynesians. Plus, the Rapa Nui society lacked many of the arts and craft traditions typical of the Incas, such as fine pottery and weaving. In 1955 to 1956, Heyerdahl led his first expedition to East Islands looking to demystify many aspects of the Rapa Nui heritage, including the Moai. 
Based on his excavations, he estimated that the ancestors of the Rapa Nui landed sometime before 380 CE, finding an island covered in luscious vegetation. Heyerdahl also identified three separate epochs in the history of the island – early, middle, and late. In the early period, the Rapa Nui did not engage in carving the giant statues. They devoted their engineering skill to erecting altar-like platforms made of large stones cut and joined together in a very precise fashion. These altars, called Ahu, had their fronts facing towards the ocean, and more strikingly, they were astronomically oriented. The Rapa Nui stonemasons must have been highly specialized, as they were able to align these platforms with the annual movements of the sun. It was during the second period that the Rapa Nui we began to quarry, carve, and place the moai on the altars or platforms. The second period lasted roughly from the year 1100 to 1680, the year in which, according to Heyerdahl, the construction of the super moai El Gigante was suddenly abandoned. The beginning of the late period was marked by the sudden end of all carving work in the quarries under the Rana Raraku volcano. Heyerdahl and his team surmised that after 1680, many of the Moai were toppled over, only one of the signs of warfare and destruction that they were about to dig out. The evidence points to the hypothesis that the island society had undergone a period of rebellion, famine, civil war, or all of the above. Or indeed, none of the above. Sorry to confuse you, but you see, unlike the Moai, the history of the island is not set in stone, and archaeologists and historians are still divided on what may have caused the decline and almost total collapse of the Rapa Nui natives. But I'll go on to those theories a bit later. I promise, but for now, let's stick with the most widely accepted narrative. Little more than 40 years after El Gigante was abandoned, on Easter Day 1722, Dutch sailor Jacob Roggeveen arrived on the island, the first European to make contact with the Rapa Nui. While Heyerdahl had found evidence of a society numbering 10 to 15,000 inhabitants thriving on a fertile and verdant landscape, Roggeveen found a completely different situation. The island was almost completely devoid of trees, and arable land was scarce. The island population had dwindled to approximately 3,000 people. Along the way, something had clearly gone very wrong. For several decades, the inhabitants of Easter Island were largely left alone, having occasional contact with European ships, but in general they were spared the ravages of unchecked colonialism. Well, at least they were for a while. In December of 1862, eight Peruvian ships landed and captured some 1,000 Easter Islanders, including the king, his son, and the ritual priests. The fact that the priests were taken may indicate that there was no longer anyone left to teach the religious customs and conduct their ceremonies. The captured islanders were sold into slavery in Peru. 90% of the Rapa Nui died within one or two years of capture. In 1865, the Bishop of Tahiti denounced the abominable practice, and the embarrassed Peruvian government rounded up the few survivors in order to return them. But smallpox broke out on the ship returning to Easter Island, and only 15 of the freed slaves survived the voyage. The resulting smallpox epidemic nearly wiped out the remaining population. 1868 saw the entire social order of Easter Island collapse, the population declining into just the hundreds. Many of them accepted an offer to relocate to Tahiti. When Chile annexed Easter Island in 1888, only 110 impoverished and disheartened inhabitants remained. Now, before I move on to the reasons behind the collapse, allow me once more to stop and take a look at the Moai. Heyerdahl's team, who had established links between Andean populations and the Rapa Nui, suggested that the tradition of the stone idols was introduced by an Incan migratory wave. These Incas simply introduced a style of sculpture similar to the one already in use back home. As I've mentioned, not everybody subscribes to the Inca theory, and more recent approaches suggest that instead the cult of the Moai was developed in a a completely indigenous fashion. During the second period of the Rapa Nui presence on the island, the inhabitants had split into several clans that were often in competition, if not in open conflicts, with each other. What unified the island residents was a shared religious belief centered around the cult of ancestors, ancestors whose likeness was celebrated in the carving of statues which became larger, more refined, and more sophisticated over time. As prosaic as it sounds, this is how a population, unfairly described as primitive by some European explorers was able to build and shift 1,000 stone giants. They simply assigned plenty of time, dedication, and skilled labor to the job, period. Oh, and the fact that the specific job at hand was fueled by rivalry certainly didn't hurt either. 
If you think about it, this recipe applies to many mysterious human enterprises, from Stonehenge to the pyramids. I know that many people like to attribute all of these awesome things to aliens, but it seems like humanity can do pretty well without the assistance of some extraterrestrials. But I digress. How did rivalry play into all of this? The clans of the Rapa Nui believed in the concept of mana, a mystical combination of power, prestige, and prosperity. In a belief system that included ancestor worship, the Moai represented a clan's most prestigious ancestors, who were believed to bestow mana on living leaders. So by building bigger statues and altars, the Ahu, each clan was in competition with its rivals, seeking to receive more mana from its forebears. According to Dr. Georgia Lee of the Bradshaw Foundation, the building of the Moai became a perceived solution to many of the issues of the Rapa Nui society. Crop failures, epidemics, local uprisings, all were addressed by carving bigger and better statues, an activity which eventually absorbed most of the whole society for decades. But the Ahu and the Moai may have fulfilled more practical function too, according to a research team led by Professor Robert J. DiNapoli from the University of Oregon. DiNapoli and co. realized that the Ahu had been erected in coastal spots in which volcanic fresh water seeps into the ocean. Their findings suggest that the Rapa Nui monuments were actually used by clans to signal the presence of a precious resource such as fresh water and to assert their control over it. The professor, however, does not entirely disregard the ceremonial value, and his paper mentions that the statues may have served two simultaneous purposes, one being functional and one being cultural. Many of the Moai were adorned with redstone crowns called Pukau. These were not carved from the main quarry, Rano Raraku, but were from a different location, Punapau. It appears that the Pukau indicated special status, red being a sacred color both to Eastern Islanders and Polynesians. Either crowned or bareheaded, many of the Moai were placed upon the Ahu platform and then were activated by having their eyes opened. More precisely, the shape of their eyes had already been carved at the main quarry, and these sockets were then filled with inlaid eyes made of coral and red stone for the pupils. According to popular belief, all Moai were placed facing the sea, as if keeping watch for the arrival or the return of mythical seafarers. Actually, most statues, and all of them placed on Ahu, face inland, looking over areas designated for ceremonies. So I just mentioned how the Moais were placed on top of their ceremonial platforms. If you remember, these guys weigh around 20 metric tons. That's almost the same as four adult elephants. So how do you shift such a weight? Well, local legend actually tells us of how these giants would walk to their altars after being carved. The Moais were initially carved on the slopes of the Rana Araku volcano. Stonemasons would sculpt three sides of the statue, which was not necessarily just a big head. Most included an elongated bust or even crossed arms. The fourth side, the back, was left rough and unfinished. Next, the Moai were lowered into the ground by ropes so that the carving could be completed. The Moai had to slide down a 45-degree slope kept in control via a system of ropes and bollards made from palm trunks. Each rope must have been about 600 feet, that's 20 meters long, and at least 3 inches or 8 centimeters thick. Once the Moai were in place, the sculptors would take care of the back of the head. Next, the Moai had to travel to its final resting place, sometimes as far away as 15 miles. The initial theory was the Rapa Nui used wooden rollers. However, research done by Professor Charles Love proved that the roads and paths used by the Rapa Nui were not level, but slightly concave, which means that rollers would have got stuck or even cracked under the pressure of the statues. Our good old friend Heyerdahl may have found the solution to this puzzle too when he returned to Easter Island in 1986. With the help of Czech engineer Pavel Pavel and a group of 16 local residents, Heyerdahl made an attempt to move a standing moai by pulling it with ropes attached to the statue's head and base. And this worked. With some muscle, ingenuity, coordination, and concerted effort, 18 guys made the statue bob along or walk in accordance with the legend. And all without much difficulty. So, well, I guess we've at least solved that mystery. I've already mentioned the best-known narrative, according to which the population of the islands went through prolonged strife, civil wars, and epidemics during the late period, collapsing on itself and almost disappearing entirely just before the arrival of the first Dutch sailors. According to a widespread theory by geographer Jared Diamond, that early decline was triggered by the islanders' own obsession with the building of the Moai. At its peak, Moai carving was a fully-fledged industry, mobilizing almost the entire population. Shifting the Moai, therefore, required the locals to 
cut down all of the palm trees on the island, either to use as wooden rollers or to produce ropes. The deforestation, in turn, left the soil exposed to erosion caused by the wind and other elements. The next consequence was crop failure, and when crops fail, societies collapse. People starve and compete violently over scarce resources. In the case of Easter Island, the Rapa Nui is engaged in civil war and even cannibalism. Preoccupied with the urgent matter of survival, the islanders simply quit building their Ahu, Moai, and Pukao. It may have been at this stage, towards the end of the 17th century, that Rapa Nui abandons the cult of the ancestors. The rights of the Birdman, with its death-defying races, took hold. Diamond's explanation has gained popularity as the ecocide theory, and it is frequently cited as a cautionary tale against the depletion of natural resources. Today, Diamond's ecocide theory has been challenged by many researchers. For example, I've already mentioned Professor Love, who argued that wooden rollers are cause for deforestation were never really used. Another critic of ecocide is Dr. Katrine Jarman of Bristol University. Dr. Jarman argues that the deforestation process may have started as early as when the first Polynesian settlers landed on the island. When they disembarked, they brought along an unwanted guest, the Polynesian rat, a voracious critter that reproduced exponentially, feasting on palm nuts and sapling trees. The rat's eating habits essentially destroyed the existing palm groves and caused the subsequent erosion and impoverishment of the arable lands. Despite this early deforestation and subsequent decline in agriculture, the Rapa Nui did not starve. Instead, they quickly adapted to the new situation by adopting a rich, shellfish-based diet. So it was lobster over potatoes, and who can really blame them? Now, if the Rapa Nui did not need to fight over food, then why did a Heyerdahl, Diamond, and others believe in a civil war amongst the clans? They cite the finding of obsidian weapons as evidence, but they may have misinterpreted their intended use. Professor Carl Lipo argues that these artifacts were domestic tools or ritual implements. He also showed that only 2.5% of human remains on the island displayed evidence of any injuries, and most of them were non-fatal. So to recap, there was no ecocide. The deforestation was a long process to which the Rapa Nui adapted efficiently. There was no civil war, and there was certainly no cannibalism. So why did so many natives die? What caused such an original and unique civilization to almost fade into extinction? Well, I've already given you the answer. Remember the slaver raids and the epidemics of the 19th century? According to previous theories, these calamities hit the island when its population had already been severely reduced by other factors. But according to the new timeline of events proposed by the likes of Jarman and Lipo, slavers were the true main culprits behind the massive demographic decline of the Rapa Nui. Less of a case of suicide then, and more of a case of kidnapping and murder. So I hope I've given you some food for thought about Easter Island, one of the most recognizable yet least understood destinations on Earth. Before I take my leave, let me ask you, what explanation do you find more believable? Ecocide or slavery and disease? And if you did enjoy this video, please do give it a thumbs up below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos twice a week. And do check out our fantastic sponsor, CuriosityStream, link below. And thank you for watching.